Hi and welcome, my name is Leslie and I work for the Scottish Drugs Forum and today I am joined by John Campbell, uh, he's responsible and manages the IEP services within NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and I'm also joined by Paul Connolly and he runs, manages, works within the Glasgow Drug Crisis Centre and the IEP service there. John, so currently there is an ongoing HIV outbreak in Glasgow, mm -hmm. uh, could you give us some of the background to that? Yeah, absolutely, we first identified the outbreak back in the early part of, of 2015, it was first identified by the labs. The labs had noticed a cluster, if you like, of, of clients that were HIV positive. Although on the face of it, they could see no real real connection. Uh, they had asked us to, to take a look uh, and see if we could see any commonality amongst the, the, the cases, which we did. We noticed they were all accessing equipment from our city centre, IEP. Uh, outlets, uh, and of course the outbreak quickly snowballed from uh, from there into a, a significant problem for us. Mm -hmm. um, and what were we seeing? What else were we seeing in that population? Maybe you know the drugs that people were using, some of the demographics in that population as well. Do we have any of that information? Absolutely, the, the demographics are really quite interesting. The, even up to this point, it's mm -hmm. been mainly confined to a, a city centre public injecting population. So a large percentage of them are homeless, if not directly sleeping rough, and temporary or, or unstable uh, accommodation. It's, the average age is 41, 65% uh, are, are male, that's not too dissimilar to what we'd expect to see uh, an IEP service uh, in, in, in general. Mm -hmm. uh, but they mirror very closely, if you like, the demographics for uh, older clients that are experiencing, are likely to experience drug-related death and overdose. John, can you also talk about some of the drugs? What are you finding from, say, NEO or other information points about the drugs that people are using? Absolutely, this was really interesting for us. So it's primarily amongst the, uh, this outbreak is primarily with amongst the heroin injecting population in the city centre. However, other pieces that I say it's a correlate with us highlight that at least 50% of this population are also injecting injecting cocaine. And of course, that becomes hugely significant when you think of the injecting, injecting frequency. Mm -hmm. So this is a real challenge for us to make sure that there's enough needles and syringes being distributed to meet to, to meet the needs. Thank you. You hmm. coordinate the um, IEP services within Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So how have the services that you coordinate been responding to um, some of the different work that they've been doing? Well, absolutely. The, I guess it was stages we had to go through when the outbreak was first, first identified. We had to identify the, the target group and target that group through information. Uh, from our IEPs, so our IEPs uh, services in the city centre were very good at uh, having face-to-face -face, uh, conversations with clients. Uh, we produced posters uh, in conjunction with the Scottish Drugs Forum. You know, we displayed in all our, all our outlets uh, as well. Uh, through the clients, we helped identify the public injecting sites that people were using. We were able to visit those, th those injecting sites. Because the information we receive uh, from our NEO, which is a web-based data collection system, is, is really robust, you know, and it carries a lot of depth. We were able to see the equipment that people were using as well, and that threw up a few surprises for us. It showed that uh, there's a disproportionately high number of clients were using uh, long needles in, in separate, mm -hmm. separate barrels, which is an indication that they'll be accessing deeper veins, which in turn is an indication that they're probably been injecting for a significant period of time. But when we looked at that two mil barrel, it was a disaster if it was going to be shared. It had a hollow chamber on uh, on the end, which would trap blood and bodily fluid after uh, after injection. So we in turn they went to the manufacturers through our suppliers Frontier and asked them to redesign that that barrel, you know, with if you like uh, a, a re total redesign of the plunger part to go in and kill as much of the dead space as we mm -hmm. uh, as we actually could. Uh, and we had to have that done, you know, and very, very quickly. So that was a, a significant challenge for us, and we obviously needed the IEP management and staff on board uh, with that. And when did that uh, the new two mil barrels come in that were the low dead space? Yeah, put things in perspective, the, the outbreak HIV was identified in the, the early part of 2015. Mm -hmm. By the summer of 2015, we had replaced all the two mil barrels with with, with, with the new uh, low dead space uh, equivalent. So it was a really, really quick turnaround in that respect. Thank you. So Paul, what about the service that you deliver at the crisis centre? Have you seen many changes um, since the outbreak's been identified? 
have we? Um, <laughs> with regards, it's a 24-7 service. Yeah. So personally, I'm in there kind of office hours. I'm 26 at the moment. Uh, during the day, it's a kind of mixed bag. You know, sometimes there might not be anybody for a couple of hours and then you can get a few coming. Later in the day, it's the kind of client group who are out later in the day where the numbers are a lot higher. There's a lot more kind of heroin, cocaine users coming, kind of early evening into the night. Um, these, are a, these are a target group then who it's difficult to engage. You know, if you're speaking to someone at that time, it's hard to then make contact with an addiction team to make contact with the likes of the hepatitis nurses, try to get tests done for them. One of the things we've done is we've started incentivised blood testing. So we're encouraging people to get a BBV test done. If they've not had one done in the last three months, um, they're getting a five pound voucher for it. Do you know, so we've noticed in that time, the increase. amount of tests has definitely increased. Excellent. Um, so what were the testing numbers like previously across Glasgow? Are we seeing a change um, in testing? Regarding the city, I'm not sure, but I know for us we were, <laughs> do you know, we're getting into double figures a month, we were happy with that. Good. Which, although we're saying good, it wasn't good. Do you know, it was hard to get people in. Um, a lot of people come into the crisis centre. By the time they come to me for needles, they've either got their drugs on them or they've got the money on them. Aye. They don't want to sit and chat even 10, 15 minutes for something that could ultimately be a lifesaver for them. They don't want to just a lot and maybe have a taxi waiting. They've been in the city, they've been doing what they're doing all day, got their money and they just want to make a quick stop and go. So it's been quite difficult now. It's, do you know, we're encouraging them to come back in the morning. Do you know, like a cup of tea, anything, a fiver, anything to try and keep them for that 10 minutes. And what I've had to adapt in myself is getting the test done as quick as possible. Yeah. Do you know, there's a lot of kind of paperwork, there's a couple of forms we filled in. While in, coming in for an exchange, I never know somebody's name. It's all confidential, there's a unique identifier, and I type that in and I always go with that. Taking them through the back to do the blood test involves then getting their name, getting a proper date of birth. A lot of people coming into Neo, mm -hmm. into the exchange, sorry. They make up, they've had a code, they've had the whole time and it's not their real name. So you've gone in the back, you're having to go through more confidentiality with them. Um, get their proper name, GP, addiction worker. So there's a whole kind of building up a totally different relationship with the person who I'm trying to encourage to come in in the first place. Paul, you and your service are seeing people affected by this outbreak every single day. Are we seeing that things are changing for the population? Well, without a doubt, um, I think previously, do you know, it was the Brownlee, Gart Naval. So people are expected to go there, you'd maybe get an appointment mm -hmm. to turn up there in three weeks. Mm -hmm. the, we're learning quick enough that this is a chaotic group. Do you know, a lot of them have they've got an appointment for two or three days away. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time that doesn't register. Two or three days away is, do you know, it's, they need something kind of brought to them. They're finding that with them. And that's exactly what's happened with this outbreak. So rather than people being expected to go to Garden Naval out to the Brown Lee, there's now a team, there's actually nurses in the city centre actively out looking for them. Mm -hmm. Do you know, to say, right, this is important that you engage here. There's a service in Hunter Street. Every every person involved with services is aware of Hunter Street. It's a 10 minute walk outside the city. Um, so the service is kind of literally on the doorstep for them. There's the lights of the Simon community who have got their outreach workers and they're happy to support people to these appointments. They'll actively look for people who are known to have been diagnosed, people who maybe are at risk. Um, do you know, look through a kind of certain client group, maybe four or five of them have tested as positive, but there's other ones who would have been part of that group. So they're actively being looked for, um, encouraged to be tested. A lot of people, I find myself, a lot of people don't want to know. Um, and that can be difficult. Do you know, it's hard. I've got a cough in here, I don't want to go to the doctor. Do you know, it's just, it'll pass. Mm -hmm. um, so, the fact the lights are clear, Lynn that are in the city, um, the three girls there, um, Lindsay, Emma and Caroline, absolutely brilliant. Do you know, they're engaging with people, they're out looking for them actively, mm -hmm. making sure these people are getting the service they need. John, any mm -hmm. other changes that you're witnessing or seeing that you think are really making the difference for the population? Well, I feel if you look at the situation in general, I guess everything's changed 
but nothing's changed as well in so in so many respects. When we look at the, the IEP figures for, for the year before the outbreak, we had 16,000 uh, transactions. In the last year, that's jumped up to 25,000 transactions, okay. just in the heart of the city centre, not including the, the, the crisis centre. If you look at the amount of needles that, that was provided, it's jumped from 112,000 before the outbreak up to 175,000. And on top of that 175,000 needles, there's you know a lot of foil been distributed uh, as well. You know, top of that, we've got the water for in, water for injection. You know, so so much has has improved in relation to to distribution and also the method of distribution as well. Since the the, the large health needs assessment was done, uh, taking away the chaos, then. Well, there's a number of recommendations from that. The most obvious ones were heroin assisted treatment and the safer consumption facility, but also recommended there should be better out of hours IEP provision. So we met that need from out of hours at, at Central Station, that coming at is now now famous, I guess, and uh, for the, from the Simon community to Hub as well. But if you actually look at the injection related injuries and complications that, that we're seeing, they're as bad now as, as, they, were, as they were back then. And I think that is really is part of the part of the problem. We can't look at HIV in, 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 isolation. in isolation. You know, no. people have very very chaotic in, in, in injectors out there. Now, I'm sure if you looked at those injectors the year before uh, the outbreak of HIV, they would have been just as chaotic. If you look at them now, two or three years on for the outbreak of HIV, for a lot they will also be quite chaotic. And there are so many factors to to do with that, you, you know, the necessity access, deeper veins, all the problems that go along with preparing and injecting your drugs uh, out, outside. We've always got one, you know, one eye over your shoulder to, to, to see what's what, what, what's happening. Yeah. So we would love to say that although we've had massive advances in everything that we're doing, particularly in relation to the amount of needles and syringes we're getting out there, we would love to sit and say this has made a huge difference and as well as a, you know, a a significant reduction in blood-borne viruses we're seeing in a significant <coughs> reduction in injecting related to them, but, but we're not. And that, that is really where a safer consumption facility would come into its own. John, um, earlier on you talked about the central station closure of mm -hmm. the IEP se um, service and you said it was quite well known. So just for people that maybe are watching that don't know, are you able to just explain a little bit more about that? Oh, absolutely. It's an absolute soap opera, I feel like. So said how the, the taking away the chaos, mm -hmm. health needs assessment had recommended there should be out of hours provision yeah. in the heart of the city centre. Uh, the only real prospect we had of doing that was to convince Boots and Central Station. The Boots and Central Station is a pharmacy that's open from 7 in the morning to, to 12 at night, when no other pharmacies within the heart of the city centre are. Uh, and Boots provide a very good IP service for us across the, the board area. Yeah, so they, they were up for that, we'd done the staff training, we introduced it fairly quickly uh, and fairly quickly became the, the busiest exchange in the board area, in fact the busiest exchange no doubt in, no doubt in Scotland and providing a service to you know, the, the clients that we really hope to provide the service to. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that both British Transport Police and, and Network Rail who manage the station didn't really want that, that, that service here you know, and they started to keep a log of any drug related incidents and drug related incidents being things like discarded needles or even discarded injecting packs if you like outer out, outer wrappers, you know, and there was an overdose and things in the toilet which which didn't help. Uh, and unfortunately, even though we had uh, input from the, the, the Scottish Government uh, and uh, uh, the chair of the ADP, it was uh, the, the closure was forced. Mm -hmm. So uh, that left a bit of a gap again for us to, to try and plug. But you have been working to refill that gap with the introduction of a mobile outreach needle exchange van. Um, absolutely, yep, yep. That's, that's really exciting. It's took a lot longer than we had hoped, but I guess that's what happens when you're getting something, you know, very, very specialist built, yep. from, built from scratch, then uh, I'm thinking we're a few weeks away from it now, it's at the, the coach builders. And the idea would be to take that van, which would be a fully equipped IEP, so fully equipped as in able to do, obviously, the IEP transactions, but also things like wound care, you know, in-depth assessments, providing a lock zone. And we would hope to site that as close to Central Station as, as possible. But, but I have to say that other pharmacies 
in the area have been superb since the closure at a, a central station. We've closed that gap. In fact, fairly quickly we closed that gap. Yes, it was a month or two where transactions started to fall significantly, as you would expect, but the other pharmacies have now you know, increased the, yeah. the, the transactions and increased provision to, to plug that. So, yeah, we hope the van is, is really going to meet the needs of those injecting in the city centre out of hours. <laughs> Paul, for the Drug Crisis Centre, what are some of the new developments going to be? Well, forward? I think as was just discussed there, the mobile van. Mm -hmm. um, it will be staff from the Crisis Centre who are manning it. Um, personally, I'm looking forward to it. I've been waiting a while for it to happen. Uh, so we'll be in the city between 6 and 10 at night. As John says, somewhere near Central Station, we know there's a lot of, kind of drug use goes on around the area. A lot of dealing, a lot of wheeling and dealing. Um, there's a good client group there. You know, and I'm sure they'll make good use of it. Uh, it's quite exciting, you know, that even the times we used to do, we were doing outreach previously, having reduction outreach on the street in Glasgow, and you'd meet a kind of certain client group during the day, you know, and it was all, it was, it was good, it was positive, but then at night time, it was a kind of different group, same as I'm saying earlier on, it's a different group. Um, a lot kind of more needs there. A lot of people don't want to engage with services, so this will be an opportunity to meet these people at night. The van is going to be there every night, so it'll be, there'll be a spot, so it'll become a kind of common feature then. It's not something that'll be there for maybe two or three nights and then it's gone and then you're waiting for it or wondering where it is. There'll be the same staff on it, the same kind of four staff team who'll be on it all the time, so that's another chance then to build up a relationship yeah. with people. We find a lot of people aware of there's different staff, of there's two staff one night and then a different staff another night and it can be hard to build a relationship so, up there because you're maybe opening up and taking a bit of trust in someone and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. So if it's the same staff team the whole time and that will build that kind of relationship up. That will then encourage the support so that, okay, they're coming for needles specifically, that's all they're there for, but through time it can then turn to the lights and referrals on, it can be the blood test and yeah. um, engaging with other services, do you know a wee bit of trust. So meeting them where they are, providing yeah. the service that they're needing and asking for. Without a doubt. Building those relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hopefully over time yeah. the trust is there to Definitely. Uh, look at other issues. A lot of the services, I think just now, the crisis centre's 24-7. Yeah. Do you know, the needle exchange never closes. People can get down there and get exchanged <coughs> two in the morning, get an exchange, Christmas Day, it doesn't matter. There's no holidays, it's just it's always opened. To bring that into the city centre is brilliant. I think a lot of people stopped. What I personally found with a lot of people was when they were begging in the city centre, like, are you like me your addiction team? No, I missed an appointment, I'm banned, I can't get back. Um, I missed the chemist three or four days in a row. So there was different things that people were stopping to attend services. Um, I think with the likes of this, we're bringing it to them then, rather than them having to adapt to the service we're providing, we're kind of adapting for them, we're being there out hours for them. Which I think is going to be a very common theme going through the different videos that we're going to be releasing this week, is um, going to where people are, taking our service mm -hmm. to them, mm -hmm. um, it's absolutely going to be a common theme. Mm. Ideally, John, what, um, what additional services do you think we still need in Glasgow to respond to this outbreak? Okay. Well, I, th I think up to this point we've responded fairly, fairly well. I think everyone involved in this outbreak really wishes it had never happened. That, that goes without, without saying. But I have to say, it, it, it's provided a window opportunity. It's provided a window opportunity for us to get together, you know, and try and establish a proper, coordinated harm reduction mm -hmm. response. For example, the health needs assessment would never have would never have happened unless there's outbreak HIV. The dry blood spot test in the community pharmacies wouldn't have happened unless there was outbreak of, of HIV. We're able to access funding to provide foil, roll it out across across the board area, mm -hmm. which wouldn't have happened unless we had the, the outbreak HIV. We've got a city centre, harm reduction action group, where all the key players providing harm reduction within a city centre get together and we share all our data and we try and shape a response. You know, and above that there's a larger harms group as well. So for somebody that's worked in the field for the past 20 years, it really feels as if harm reduction is, is, is back on the, the agenda. You know, and people involved in it are trying as hard as possible to make sure 
all approaches are as good as they as good as they can be, you know. And it's unfortunate it took a it took an outbreak of HIV to get there, but. So for people that might work or have responsibility for services out with Glasgow and are maybe not facing this outbreak, do you think there's some actions that they should be taking now? Um, what would be your key advice to people that are working in an area that there isn't an increase in HIV in this population? Well, I, I think I think the response in Glasgow has already shaped responses across across the country. Mm -hmm. You know, we were able through the Prevention Leads Group to promote uh, improvements to the the Neo database, and for the first time, develop Neo to allow staff to conduct a full and proper assessment of injecting injecting risk. It's a huge development. And for the first time, we'll be able to provide national reports across across the country. Every area will be providing the same the, the, the same data. There's been massive improvements to the in injecting equipment that we give out, and along with the national tender that's in place across across the country, ensures that there's a degree of standardisation, mm -hmm. you know, for, for for everyone involved. So yeah, Glasgow is certainly be the epicentre of this outbreak, and to this point, I guess it's been relatively relatively confined, but mm -hmm. certainly our, our response has been taken on board by a number of other Excellent. health boards as well. As just to echo what John's saying, people using coats, so there's a lot more kind of needles, you know, where somebody previously was coming in and taking away five one hit kits, now they're taking away 20 and 30, bags of 50. And you know, they're actually they asking for that? Oh, they're asking yeah. for it, yeah. Um, and it's very common. Excellent. Um, well, not excellent, but it's excellent that they're coming in and they're yeah. realising that they, they, ha they need that additional supply mm -hmm. and they're asking for it. But then there is an obvious increase in the rights of a need for wound care, because people are injecting a lot more. Yeah. Um, it's obviously a lot of one-hit kits going, but people are taking more blues because there's a lot of damage to the veins. The day I had the lad and, and the veins are just talking, and he's inquiring about groin injecting. And I'm not trying to talk him out of it, but I'm advising against it. and. Looking at his sights, looking at his arms, trying to encourage safer use there, encouraging the use of foil. Do you know about somebody who just doesn't know, but he was telling me, he's a foreign lad, but he's telling me about how his friend, I was showing him the, the below the belt, the posters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know, there's a couple of different things on it, like kind of vascular problems or abscesses of the champagne bottle. I've given that to take away, but he's saying his friend has got that and his friend is still injecting in the groin, and he's aware that his friend is going to lose his leg, and he's just kind of laughing it off with me as if his friend's mental, but still at the same time, he's asking me, how does he do it? How do they inject in the groin? So, they're aware of consequences, but the consequences... Yeah. It's, uh, sometimes it can be, it'll never happen to me, or again, as John says earlier on, well, I need a hit today. Do you know, if I lose my leg in 10 years' time, I'll worry about that then. Maybe it will never get to that, but mm -hmm. I need a hit the day, and if that's what it means, if that's the risk I have to take, then that's what we'll do. Um, thank you, Paul and John, for coming in and sharing your experience, some of the learning. Um, just want to say thank you very much. Yeah.